Hello there, my name is Sean Dillman. Welcome to this video, Microsoft Office for Law School and Beyond, part two. As I mentioned in the first part of this video, this is a version of a presentation that I recently gave to the University of Toronto as part of their leadership skills program. And I got a great testimonial from the director of the Future of Law Lab. And there was about 100 people in attendance, first year students, second year students, third year students, grad students and pre-law students, and it went really well. So I wanted to make this uh, series into a free YouTube video so that more people could see it and get use out of it. So if you like this video, please be sure to subscribe to my channel right now. And before I begin, uh, I made these comments on the first part of the video, but I'll, I'll make them again in case you're, you're checking this video out first. So this presentation contains slides and screen sharing only which means that you won't be seeing my face on this video because the purpose of the presentation is to walk you through specific steps and show you ways to use Microsoft Office uh, and showing my face doesn't really help with that. And we kind of want all of the available space on the screen to, to be able to show you the software. So on that note, I'll be showing you all kinds of different screens that are used in the different Office programs that we'll be talking about. And the idea is for this to be a really practical demonstration and walkthrough. So please make sure that you are watching this on full screen on your side so that you can see all of the little details. On my side, I've made the software about as big as I can within reason. So for you, I need you to be in full screen mode so that you can see all of the little details. And as far as the slides go, if you'd like a copy of these, just visit my website at seandillman.com and you can request them through there and I can give you a copy of these. Okay, so with that, here's a little bit of information about me. In a nutshell, I was called to the BC Bar in 2016. And before I entered the world of law, I was a, a computer engineering technology student and I worked as a web developer and a technician for IBM. Throughout my legal career, I've been a barrister and a solicitor, and in, most recently in 2018, I opened a firm with a colleague where I continued my practice and was a co-managing partner. So I am now focusing on leadership and development, and I think I'm kind of the perfect person to give this information to you because I am an experienced lawyer and I've, I've been practicing as a barrister and as a, and as a solicitor, but I also still really remember law school quite well, and I think that this information is going to be really helpful for you. So yeah, really quickly, the target audience is basically any student with any level of computer knowledge, whether you think you have strong computer skills or not so strong computer skills, that's fine. I'm confident that you'll learn something in this video that'll give you a boost. And as far as the structure goes, as I mentioned, this is a two-part series because there's just so much information to cover. In part one, I covered OneDrive and Word because I think that those are the applications that are most useful for law school. And in this video, part two, we're going to be looking at Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and Outlook. Uh, I did use these applications kind of less than you know OneDrive and Word, but I still used OneNote every day at law school. I used PowerPoint all the time. I used Excel all the time. I didn't use Outlook as much, but as I'll be showing you, Outlook is important for kind of the beyond part of, of the name of this, this presentation, uh, Microsoft Office for Law School and Beyond, because if you're gonna be working in an office and if you're gonna be in legal practice, using Outlook is definitely something that you'll be doing. As far as the format goes, we have the micro level, which means I'll be showing you specific things, you know, click here, you're going to see that, uh, you know, follow these steps, this is why you're doing it. And then I'll also be discussing kind of the macro level, which is higher level concepts. And these may be things that you, you can't necessarily put into practice right now because you're at law school and this, the timing isn't right, but this may be information that you can use later when you start getting into an office and you start getting into your working, your working career. And to fill in some of the blanks, I may just ask that you go and check out YouTube content that I've already made, which will show you walkthroughs for specific things, as I did with the uh, Picture Manager software in part one of this series. So yeah, please note that although this is approximately an hour long video, I'm trying to make it as efficient as possible and, and direct you to other resources that you can look at if, uh, if that's the best thing to do and the best way to use our time here. Okay, one word about Office 365 uh, before we get started. As I mentioned in part one, I, I do not work for Microsoft. I, I would let you know if I did, but I am a big fan. I've been using it since I was a kid. Uh, it probably explains why I have such bad handwriting now because I, have, I submitted all of my essays and all of my work uh, in a printed out format, you know, long ago, you know, in the mid 90s. And there are, of course, competitors to Microsoft, like OpenOffice and the, the software offered by Google and Apple. But in my opinion, the Microsoft package is just kind of unbeatable in terms of what it provides. 
you know, depending on the package, it's about 10 or 20 bucks a month and you get a terabyte or more of cloud storage, depending on the um, package that you've signed up for. And you get all of this software that I'm discussing, OneDrive, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, Outlook. So yeah, in my opinion, it's just kind of unbeatable for how much it costs versus what you get. You get so much value and it doesn't really cost that much. And as I mentioned in part one, I will not be discussing SharePoint, Teams, or Skype because I don't necessarily think that these applications are useful for law students. And uh, if you want to know about Picture Manager, please check out the part one video in which I discuss what Picture Manager is and why it's useful and how to install it. Okay, so let's get into it. Part two, this is going to cover Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, and Outlook. Okay, so in this first section, we're going to start with Excel. And Excel is definitely something that is useful at law school. Uh, as you see on the left-hand side, there's all these different uses, and then law school is in the center, and then um, legal practice is on the right. I didn't use Excel, like the, the advanced features of Excel, that much at law school. However, I definitely used it a lot, and there's all kinds of things that you can do with Excel. The same in legal practice, um, you know, essentially because it is a spreadsheet. That's another way of thinking about it. You know, like if you were to take a piece of paper and make you know, horizontal and vertical lines and make rows and columns. Having a spreadsheet can be extremely useful. So there's really nothing else like Excel. You know, you, you can make tables in Word or you can make tables in uh, PowerPoint and other programs like that. But, you know, Excel offers so much power that uh, you just can't get from applications. So we're going to be looking at that and, and starting to get into the uses. And we're going to kind of go through it in a way that shows you like really simple stuff. And then we're going to kind of increase to the more advanced stuff as we go along. So here's the, 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 the easiest way in the universe that it's useful, and I used this immediately at law school. This is literally an image of the, um, the, the schedule that I made, and then I printed it out and I put it on my binders and stuff so that I knew where I was supposed to be and when for you know, my trusts, you know, legal skills, estate planning, you know, blah, blah, blah. So this just uses rows and columns and highlighting. There's no formula, there's no smarts, there's nothing, right? So I'm gonna build up to the more advanced stuff. Um, this is a, a, an image that I use in legal practice. Uh, this is, again, there's no smarts, but it's more complex because it's tracking a lot of data. This is essentially all of the client property that I was holding. Well, actually just wills. I wasn't holding a lot of other client property like jewels or pearls or tiaras or anything like that. But uh, people did like uh, do like their lawyers to hold on to their wills and their vault or their power of attorney and stuff like that. So you got to track that. Um, from a business perspective, by the way, uh, you know, I, I had this lawyer that gave me a great piece of advice, which is, you know, get their will and, and they think that you're their lawyer, like they'll see you as their lawyer. It's kind of true, right? If, if you're holding their will, you know, you it's theirs, it's their property, but they, they'll think of you as their lawyer. So there can be a good business reason to hold it. Some lawyers don't like to hold wills because it means you've got an obligation, you've got to have a fireproof vault. It also means that you have to report to the law society every year, well, in my jurisdiction anyways, and you have to say, this is the client property that I'm holding and this is who I'm holding it for. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Some lawyers like to hold uh, wills and different documents for clients because as I mentioned, it kind of makes the person think of you as their lawyer. However, the downside is that if you're holding a will for somebody or if you're holding their, their company uh, records, and if something were to happen to those documents or something, you know, you'd you'd be the one responsible. And you do have to re report to the law society to tell them uh, regularly about the the state of affairs with respect to those documents. So I'll leave that to you to make your own decision about uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And you know, there's there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just kind of a, uh, up to the individual lawyer. This is an extremely important document, um, CYA, cover your arse. Um, this is a document that I used, anonymized, but this is actually the document I used when I was an article student. I had no idea what I should be doing, so I did this. I, that's kind of what I do in life. If I don't know what to do when I've got a challenge, I try to find some technology to help me. So as an article student, it's like, hey, do this task. Hey, do this task. Hey, do this task. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I need to track this stuff. I need to track like you know, what's the file? What's the client name? Um, how much time did I spend on that? What did I do? Who, who's, what lawyer is this for? You know, where did I get it from? You know, all of this stuff. And for a lot of students who are watching this, ideally you are either at a firm or you'll end up at a firm that has uh, a better way of tracking this, that you actually have a software system in place. But if you don't and you need your own system or you just want a really uh, quick and efficient way to do this, using Excel is a great way to track all of this information. I highly recommend it because 
this next diagram, I just love that I found her image. I'm, I'm so glad that I found this picture. Ta-da! Like, look at them. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so those balls that have fallen on the ground, those are the files, right? And the, the dog is the article student that's like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Because that happened to me, you know, when I was an article student. You know, some lawyer comes into your office, you hardly know their name, and they say, you know, how's it going with the Johnson file? And you're like, uh, <laughs> like I'm working on a hundred things. Like, I don't, I don't know. So that's why you need the spreadsheet, right? You open the spreadsheet and you say, uh, that was given to me by your assistant two hours ago. Two, two hours ago. Nothing. I've done nothing on the Johnson file, but at least you know, right? At least you can say that. Or they, or they, you can say, uh, oh, your assistant gave me that two weeks ago. Um, I, dr I wrote a memo. Did you not get that memo? And then they're like, no, I didn't get that memo. And then you print it off or you send it to me. Go, there you go. And you're like, whew. Like, you know, I'm glad that I had a spreadsheet. I'm glad that I had a way of tracking that. So anyway, tracking, tracking your data. Uh, legal practice, similar thing. So in legal practice, I, I mentioned doing somebody's will. Um, here in Victoria, if you, if you draft a will for somebody, it's like a flat fee thing, generally speaking. It's like 500 to $1,000, depending. Um, and, you, you know, so you can track your time if you want to, but, you know, why would you if you're just going to charge 500 bucks or 1000 bucks or whatever? Um, but for hourly rate files, if you're doing a litigation file, um, this is a file I did, anonymized. This is a file I did where... A guy was unsophisticated, he actually lived in the woods, and his daughter was his representative, and he wanted to know what was going on with his deceased brother's estate, um, but his other brother kind of seized control and he wanted my help. So this is just like a one-pager uh, over a couple weeks, I guess, of like the stuff that we did, and I guess I covered it up at the bottom there, but it says 5.1. So 5.1 times my hourly rate, you know, there's your bill, right? It's important to just track that. and. There is software for this. There's better ways to do this. So um, keep that in mind. You know, if you're working at a firm that has, oh gosh, you know, Clio, Smokeball, Practice Panther, Cosmolex, Easy Law, PC Law, da, 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 da. if you're using actual software, use that. Do not do this. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that more coming up, actually. Um, yeah, and that's that's exactly what I'm saying here. Really watch out for this. You do not want to be entering your data twice for no good reason. You know, if you already have Practice Manager software. This, that, this should not be going in a spreadsheet, it should be going there. Um, this is a document that actually is starting to have some smarts. So this is um, a, a client of mine where uh, I was administering an estate. Um, so the, the funds received over here um, is the this blue column. Uh, well, I guess yeah, both one column is blue, the other one's kind of gray. The blue is calculating the funds in. So that's just the sum of all of those figures up above. So the money we got from the bank, the money from their insurance, the money from Canada Post, uh, Canada Pension Plan, da, 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 da. So we take all this money into our trust account and that's the estate funds. That's how much money this deceased person you know, has in their estate, you know, in a manner of speaking. On the other side, the red column, we're calculating how much funds out. You know, what did we pay to my first firm? And then I, I actually transitioned to another firm. So that's why it says second law firm, third firm. Um, what did we pay to the accountant? What did we pay to the minister of finance? Do, 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 right? And eventually we're gonna have money to give to the beneficiaries only after we've covered all the estate, estate expenses. Um, so there's a little bit of smarts here. And then the final smarts in this document, and again, not a lot of smarts, right? We're just summing a, 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 a column. We're summing another column, and then now what we're doing, uh, funds in minus funds out, is how much money do we actually have in trust, like right now? So like a trust, a trust wreck is what they'll call it, like a trust reconciliation on like a really small level. I'm assuming that the law society wherever you are is similar to the law society where I am, in that they are really particular about trust funds. You know, you, you can't have too much, you can't have too little. You're supposed to have exactly the amount of money that's you're supposed to have for your clients, and don't abscond with the funds to Tahiti and stuff like that. Okay, so. We're going to move on to PowerPoint. Uh, again, uh, there's basic stuff you can do, and then there's kind of stuff that you can do for legal practice that's a little bit more fun. This is just a as just a dead simple like presentation that you may have done at law, you know, that you may do at law school. This is from my ethics class, issues and regulation. You know, you just do the standard PowerPoint kind of thing. Um, this is with respect to um, this is a diagram from my criminal law class about claiming self-defense. So you can use PowerPoint uh, and the elements to do stuff that's a little bit more graphically kind of, I don't know, nuanced. So um, this is like if, if you're going to try to use the self-defense plea in a criminal law proceeding, um, you know, what kind of harm did you apprehend? You know, A, B, C. And then what happens after you do that? And then, you know, how does that branch out at the bottom? 
Um, and then I'll show you one more. This is from, um, I, I took a, a secured transactions course and this is a, a case out of Ontario, basically where multiple parties had a secured um, secured interest, like a, um, oh, what do they call those? Like a general security grant, G GSA. So people had a, had these, these agreements, um, but some agreements superseded other agreements. And then the last agreement seemingly superseded the first agreement. So you had this circular priority problem and it was extremely difficult to figure out. And this diagram, once upon a time, when I was more familiar <laughs> with, the, with the case and the class, this di diagram was actually quite helpful in going like, oh, okay, that's what's going on with this very weird case. So, you know, maybe like Donahue and Stevenson, maybe you don't need a diagram to figure out like, here's bottle, here is snail, person ingests snail, person sues, you know, like that's not super helpful. But for other types of cases that involve more complex and bizarre scenarios, then, you know, that, that may indeed be a useful thing. Okay, uh, this is actually something that I made at my second law firm that I worked at. It was a big firm and I had no idea who the heck anybody was or where they sat. So I made an office map because who are these people? Where do they sit? You know, somebody walks up to you and, and you're like, oh, I don't know who you are. And they give you something. So then what I would do is I would take that paper and then I would just stroll in the office and then I would see where they sit. And then I'd go, oh, and then I'd go back to my chart and go, that was Nancy. Okay, Nancy is this person very helpful, right? I kept that next to my desk. Um, people change, you know, there's turnover. So you always know who everybody is. And also their contact information was like a separate piece of paper, you know, what's their extension, email address, name, you know, what's their position, what's their role, stuff like that. So, you know, again, this is kind of a dead simple thing, but I don't know a better piece of software to, to, to use than this. You wouldn't do this in Excel, it would be brutal. Um, if you did this in Photoshop, it would take way too long. Like Photoshop is over the top for this. You wouldn't use paint. You'd want to pull your, you know, your hair out if, you know, it'd be so upsetting to, to try to fix it all up. So anyway, PowerPoint it is, in my view. Um, corporate org chart. Uh, I expect that by now there is, or, or perhaps for a while, there's there's dedicated software to, you know, for this. But you can make organization charts in legal practice so that if you've got a client and they've got very diverse and complex holdings, you can keep the whole thing straight. So um, this is a, a diagram that I made for a client. He had uh, numerous companies in Canada, mostly BC Incorporated. One was federally incorporated. He also had a company in Australia. Um, I've changed all the data and everything, but uh, some of his companies owned other companies. Um, so, you know, eventually it gets pretty complex when, you know, he calls you on the phone and he wants to talk to you about, I don't know, US Geology Schools Limited. That's the um, second from the right on the bottom. And if you are not aware that that is owned entirely by Euro Atlantic Mining Corporation, well, it's kind of important to know that and to realize that. So this is an org chart that for this client, you know, call, call this client a whale, if, if you will. It kind of was for, for my firm. Um, it was important that we knew exactly what companies he had, where and what their statuses were. Um, so org charts can be very helpful. Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is some makeshift Photoshop. You know, you can make business cards in, in PowerPoint. Uh, you know, if you if you export it properly, you can actually have them as a vector file as opposed to like a raster file, meaning like the file can be like like infinitely dense, like a like a PowerPoint or sorry, like a um, um, PDF file. So that if you send it to the printer as a PDF, don't send it as a PowerPoint. Um, but if you send it as a PDF with like infinite resolution, they can actually print you a business card that'll look not bad. And I know there's business card builders on like Canva and on websites and stuff, but. Anyway, if you wanted to do that in-house in though, you know, you can use it for that. I also made our Christmas card using PowerPoint, same deal. It was really easy. There's these little icons in PowerPoint, you, you bring them down. And, you know, I guess I should point out that there's so much in PowerPoint that I'm not talking about, like at the top where it says like slideshow and animations and transitions. But I, I suppose the reason I'm not talking about that is, you know, number one, I think that that stuff's all, all fairly rudimentary. But number two, I think that people in our positions, we don't really care about the bells and whistles anymore. Like if you're doing a presentation, nobody wants the slide to like twinkle in and they don't want like, woo, 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 like they don't want the icons to fly around. You know, they probably want a presentation like I'm giving, which is just like slide, 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 right? So that's why I'm showing you you know, I'm trying to show you real stuff that I actually used with it. Um, and this is the final example. So somebody gave me a free computer, old computer, and I was like, cool, what am I going to do with this? And then I looked at it and it had an HDMI output. And I thought, oh, I'm going to put up a TV in our waiting room and I'm going to connect the HDMI cable to the back of this computer and I'm going to run a, a slideshow on loop. 
Um, so this is not an actual picture of my office, but it's just an approximation. But there's like that TV up there. So if you've got people sitting in your waiting room, um, they're there to see you about their wills, uh, it's flicking through. And then they see the slide that says you also do real estate and they're like, oh, you do real estate. So after you talk about their wills, then they talk to you about doing real estate. So. You know, I, again, as I said at the onset, this is micro stuff and macro stuff. You know, maybe you don't need to make a slideshow for your <laughs> clients that you don't have at the law firm that you don't work at right now, but you may, and maybe you'll keep this in mind, or maybe you'll suggest it at the place that you work because, you know, it doesn't take much to get a, a computer with, you know, Windows and PowerPoint. Actually, I didn't even use PowerPoint. I used Open Office. Um, it runs just the same. Um, you know, computer, HDMI cable, flat screen TV, and there you go. You've got like a cool display that you can run at your office. Um, okay, so now we are at the second to last subject, which is OneNote. Um, long story short, I have a love-hate relationship with OneNote, and I'll tell you why. It has a lot of functionality, but at the bottom, um, I, I've got a note there where I'm warning you about problems. So generally, it's really good for taking notes and collaborating and multi-use and stuff like that, and it's got a really sunny outlook. But there's there's issues um, as far as how it works though it's it's actually really cool it's really simple uh, a notebook is like a binder a section is like a tab and a page is like a piece of paper um, and I'll actually kind of show you that very specifically so there's our, our notebook law school and this is actually my, my law school notes um, sections equal courses so there's those were my courses at the top and then class was my class notes at the side I would just add a new entry every time we had a new class and I needed to take notes and the great thing about the note keeping thing is super versatile, right? You can just type forever. You can bring in links, images, audio, video, whatever. And for students, this is really useful because you can kind of enable uh, a multi-user collaboration. So you can all kind of go into the document at the same time. And up until recently, the software was very stable and I almost never crashed it. There has been some changes that I'll be discussing. So unfortunately, that's not true anymore, but it is generally really stable software, which, which is a really valuable thing especially in legal practice when you need to know that it's working properly and you know it's not going to let you down during a client meeting or if you're in court or something like that generally speaking one note is pretty stable legal practice it works similarly um, instead of your courses at the top i would have like practice areas actually i even had a section called team meetings very useful we had like a a, a regular team meeting and then before the next team meeting i'd review the last team meeting notes and any action items bring those into the new meeting um, on the right hand side, this is where the clients would go and I'd store their, their information. And there's lots of space to add notes. However, there's problems. There's lots of problems. Okay, number one, using OneNote, there's, and by the way, there's two versions. So one is called OneNote, just OneNote. The other one is called something else. I'll get to that. Using OneNote, there is no way to auto sort the sections or the pages. It's absurd. Uh, Microsoft is aware of the problem. If you search on Google, it's the first thing that comes up. You're like, I can't auto sort. And then they offer this ridiculous solution where they say, if you have more than one node and you want to change the order, you can simply drag and drop your notebook icons. Well, if I've got like 14 or 15 entries, like, okay, that's not so bad. But like, what about when you get into like 73, 74, 173, 200, 500 clients? You can't just drag stuff around, right? Like it's, it's ridiculous. So it's, you know, yeah. So as I say there, right, it's terribly impractical. Uh, there is a silver lining, which is that the search function in OneNote is actually really great. I've never lost data in there. It's sometimes it can be tricky to find somebody like, you know, if you've got a client whose name is like, oh, I don't know, Will Power, good luck. Because <laughs> if you type in like Will, you're going to find the word Will everywhere. You type in Power, you're going to find Power everywhere. So it can be painful. It's not great. Um, but yeah, I've never lost data. It can search in the notebooks and in the sections. Okay, so now we're gonna get into this other version. So there's a version of OneNote called OneNote for Windows 10. And it does have an auto sort function. Great, that's cool, but there's a problem. The problem is that there's this weird inconsistency between the two versions. So OneNote, which is in the top left, which is kind of the more traditional office looking version, that's my favorite. I've been using that since law school and they've stopped supporting it, I'll, I'll get to that. The other version, Windows for OneNote for Windows 10 in the top right corner, it's kind of, for me, it's, it doesn't have the advanced functions. It's a bit too remedial. So, so I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So with OneNote, the more office-y looking version, Microsoft is ending support. They're very clear about that. And I think that they've already started because all of a sudden one day, and I didn't, I didn't circle it, but in the top left corner, there's a little caution sign. It won't sync anymore. So I don't know why all of a sudden that happened, but it just doesn't sync anymore. I'm guessing that they cut off the 
uh, they cut off the, the support. Um, OneNote for Windows 10 is a generic version, but it's got like inferior features and it doesn't have the speak uh, text thing. So basically I was forced off of OneNote to OneNote for Windows 10, but it doesn't have the feature that I want. So now I have to like go into Word and it's like, oh, like why did they do this? Like there's worse problems to have in life, but that's that's how I feel. I'm, I'm in a, between a rock and a hard place and it's like, you know, I don't know which what to do. I, basically, what I'm doing now is I'm kind of using OneNote for Windows 10, and if I need to like use the reader, I open Word and I copy and paste it, and then I do my text to speech there, and then I go back. It's absurd, but that's what I do. Um, warning number three: it's a bit of a data trap. So, um, so what I mean by that is the export functions for OneNote are terrible. So you can like export it as a big PDF, like a single page, it's like a huge PDF, like no page numbering, no page divisions. You can, ex I think you can export it as like an HTML file, like a web-based file. That's not useful, right? So the, it's it's not great. Um, and then uh, the double entry problem. So here's a bunch of images of different practice management software, Smokeball, EasyLaw, Clio, uh, Cosmolex. So if you're at a firm and you've already got software where you're tracking client data, you're tracking time entries or something, you know, you probably want to just be using that anyways. That's not as easy to access though when you just want to know like, oh, I met with you know Will Power last week. What did we talk about? OneNote is good for that. It's fast. So, um, oh, also it's a general purpose software. It's not specifically designed for legal practice. If there's problems with it, it's understandable. So my conclusion is that it is kind of a work in progress, which is weird to say because it's been out for a long time. But they do not have a nailed down version that is you know perfect in my view. But to get back to the good stuff about OneNote, you know, you sync it with OneDrive and it makes sure that all your data is there and safe and secure. Um, the, the, the app version works pretty well. Sometimes it's kind of slow to pick up changes. Um, speech to text, you take your smartphone, you push the microphone icon, you say whatever the heck you want to say, I'm writing this note, blah, 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 blah. And generally speaking, the notes will appear in OneNote pretty quickly. I would invite you to try that sometime. That's what this slide is about. Essentially, you know, give it a go if you're not doing this already. If you have some notes to make in a class or something or a reminder to yourself, um, instead of typing it out with your thumbs uh, on your phone or with your, your fingers on your keyboard on your computer, use the speech to text feature that you already have on your smartphone and you can save tons of time. I used to do this all the time at law school and all the time in legal practice. And on that note, in legal practice, not a lot of people use old timey dictation machines and tapes, but some people do. This is much better because essentially if you dictate into the you know, Simpson, uh, Homer and Marge file, it's gonna go right into that file. And for the people you're working with, like uh, if this was a teammate or you know, a, an assistant, they like that because they can get access to the data immediately. And if you're going to the courthouse and you make a note and it goes into that client file, they can see that real time and that's pretty cool. So there are alternatives. I think that there's similar problems with all of them. So you just kind of need to pick the application that works for you. Um, at law school, I found that OneNote worked really well because I wasn't sharing it with a lot of people. Um, when it came time to do my outlines, um, I basically just would copy and paste out of OneNote into a Word file so that I had something that I could print so that I could physically bring it to exams. And if you want, I actually have a note taking precedent that I've basically built up with the custom fields and the sections and the stuff that I mentioned in the Word section. I already have that done and that is included as part of the materials with this presentation. And with that, we are at the final subject, which is Outlook. Um, as, as always, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see the different use cases. Uh, some apply to law school. Most of these apply to after law school. But Outlook is a really powerful piece of software. It's very important. Um, it's, you send emails with it. You can also manage your calendar with it. And I'm going to show you a lot of stuff uh, around why you want to use Outlook to do that. So to start, uh, I think one of the most important things for a law student with respect to Outlook is, is to use it as a digital calendar, right? You need to know, you know, what time does your first exam start in the exam period and what time does it finish and when is your next exam? Is it later that day? Is it tomorrow? Uh, you know, the day after, I should say. Um, you know, what's going on with that stuff? What time are your classes every day? Uh, what time is that event where you're going to meet with potential employers? What time is your interview? You know, obviously there's there's a million things that you can put in your calendar and there's a million reasons why it's important to have a digital calendar and why you want to track it. 
Um, but one of the more important things uh, beyond law school is that you can actually share it with teammates and the people that you work with because you know, it's digital, it's electronic. And there's all kinds of controls that you can actually put in place where you can share the uh, general availability that you have in your calendar without sharing the details. So for example, let's say you had a doctor's appointment and you didn't want to share that with everybody in the office, you can actually set a control on that so that people can see that you're blocked off for that time, but they don't actually see you know, what's the contents of the meeting and why it's blocked off. So that's an important thing. This slide is, uh, is something that I wanted to show. This is actually my law school calendar that I was using. Um, as you can see there, it looks like a lot of people's calendars where I've, you know, I've scribbled out this and I've drew arrows there. You know, I put, I, I wrote something in the wrong place and, you know, legal skills over there on the right hand side. I'm not, I don't quite remember what that was. Some must have been important. It's the biggest thing on the page. So, so this is the calendar that I used at law school for three years. I bought one every year and I really enjoyed using this. However, when I got to my first law firm and showed it to my assistant that I'd be working with, this is essentially what she looked like. Uh, and the reason she looked like this is because she did not enjoy at all that my calendar was on paper because she couldn't access it. Uh, other people couldn't uh, schedule things in my calendar. It was not a helpful thing. So my advice to you would be to start getting comfortable now because you are going to want that in the future in legal practice. Um, you know, if you use something like Calendly or, or even the, the calendar um, scheduling tool that comes with Microsoft Office 365, people can schedule things in your calendar. Well, you, you can give them a link and they can look at your calendar and they can schedule times that work for them. You've, you've probably used something like this already, but it's, it's hugely valuable. It saves tons of time. So even though I loved my, my paper uh, day timer very much, and I enjoyed, you know, taking it around and I, I liked writing things down and, and I, I found that that worked for me. At the end of the day, it probably would have been better if I had been using Outlook the whole time. So to share calendars, uh, you actually just click up here in Outlook. I'm just going to kind of walk you through this really quick. So you go to the top, you click on share calendar and then other people can see the contents of your calendar and they can manage events. They can put things in there. So yeah, so trusted colleagues can do work if you need it to be done. So for example, on this slide, it says draft retainer letter, read Johnson file. So if you set that in your calendar at some point, you know, let's say um, you set that on Monday at uh, noon is when you plan to do that. Well, if one of your uh, team members or one of your assistants were to see that in your calendar, they could actually start uh, getting that work done ahead of time, possibly by, you know, making the Word document, uh, setting the formatting, uh, putting in the information for, you know, who the letter is going to. You know, the assistant may not be capable of, of, you know, putting everything in the letter that needs to be there and doing the actual drafting. That's probably your job as a lawyer. However, they can actually help you start getting things done. And, and if they didn't have access to your calendar and they didn't know what you were working on and they didn't know what you were doing, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, moving to the mobile version for a moment, it's extremely powerful. You know, I use it all the time. I, I, I look at it every day. Um, you know, it helps me make sure that I, I don't miss a, a very important meeting. You know, let's say somebody's buying uh, a piece of property or something, or somebody is signing their will or, or a client is coming in. You know, you need to know what's going on in your calendar and, you know, what better way than to just have it integrate uh, onto your smartphone. With respect to the desktop version, I really prefer this this view, which is the desktop, uh, like the the week view. Pardon me. So you click up there on week, and it shows you you know Sunday to Saturday and everything in between. That's very useful because sometimes things come up on Sundays and Saturdays. I hate to hate to say it, but sometimes you have to work weekends in legal practice, and that happens. So it's good that you get to see the whole week and yeah as I say here you know it gives you the best overview you see everything kind of right in the right in the center of your screen all of your main stuff all of your important stuff and another great thing about Outlook is that you can actually use it at, use it as a task scheduler which in my view is kind of different than an event scheduler so an event scheduler would be um, you know if, if you're gonna be going on a trip or something you know this is gonna be happening you're gonna be in court you know some kind of event is occurring somebody's birthday is happening as opposed to a task, which is, you know, draft this document or, um, you know, meet with clients, you know, obviously there can be some overlap between, you know, what is a task and what is an event, but um, by using Outlook as a task scheduler, again, as I mentioned, you can share it with your staff and then you can set things as all day events. 
So that way there's no fixed start time or no end time. And you can do this for events or for uh, tasks. And as I show you here, the great thing about that as well is you can see your tasks relative to other tasks and you can see your tasks relative to events, which appear at the bottom of the screen. So what's great about this, uh, and, and actually I set up an, uh, a step-by-step -step example so we can really kind of look at this a little bit more closely. So if we have this event which says prepare draft wills for the Browns, we want to know, can we defer this task? Well, if we look at the next day, we see that we're out of town on Wednesday, all day, we're in court. So that's probably not a great time to, uh, to be drafting wills for the Browns. And then if we look at the next day, we see that the meetings with the Browns to sign their will is actually happening there uh, in the morning on Thursday. So we probably can't defer it. You know, we're either going to need to draft the wills or we're going to get need to get somebody else to do it or we're going to need to just reschedule the meeting with the Browns. One of those three things. But if you didn't have this kind of a view and outlook, it may not be so clear to you, you know, can I defer this? You know, what can I do with this uh, task? Another great thing is uh, it, there's a record keeping function here. And for, for students, I actually picked an example that was just kind of a personal example. You know, it says start taking new medication. So that happened on Friday, the 21st, uh, some month in 2022, uh, from what we can see on the screen. So the great thing about that is, you know, if you are, um, you know, a month into the future, three months, six months, a year, and for some reason you want to know when did I start taking that medication, that'll be in your calendar. You can always look back at that. And that can come in really handy for client information. You know, what day did I meet with those clients? That comes in handy when you're billing. You know, what day did I go to court? How long was I in court? All of that information is extremely valuable. And that leads me to this slide, which is actually kind of a, a really broad concept that I apply in legal practice, which is don't delete anything. Keep all of your records because you never know what's going to be a useful record. Uh, you know, I definitely don't delete anything out of my calendar, like unless unless I'm 100 percent sure that, you know, it was a mistake or it shouldn't have been scheduled or it was never going to happen. But if I have a meeting that is in my calendar and then it doesn't proceed because the clients cancel it, I instead of deleting it out of my calendar at the front of the event, I'll go and I'll write, you know, clients canceled and then I'll leave all of the rest of the information there so that I know if they, you know, let's say they book again and they cancel in the future and they book again, and they cancel in the future. I'll be able to look back at my calendar and say, you know, look at look at what these people are doing, right? I met that we were supposed to meet on this day and they canceled. We were supposed to meet on that day and they canceled, right? If you deleted the records, you may not be able to see it that easily. Okay. And another practical kind of practice related note here is that you can use your records to find billable hours. So again, going back to that example about being in court. Um, if for whatever reason, you know, you had a busy week and you, you weren't keeping on top of your billings, you know, you weren't recording, you know, when did I do this and when did I do that? Well, at least you can look in your calendar and that may help you get a hint of, you know, which day was I in court? How long was I in court? When did I meet with the clients? Because that is all, you know, very billable time, right? You know, every, every minute that you're in court, you can generally charge that to the client, assuming that it's a, a billable file, not a contingency or something like that. Okay, so this slide is showing that you can also add really useful entries to your events. So for example, here, I just used another generic uh, example, call to change oil and car. And then below I wrote, you know, this is the date of the last oil change and this is the kilometers. And oh, I wanna remember to ask about changing the air filter. So if we were using the paper version of a calendar, like I showed you, like I used in law school, you know, it's not so easy to just add in these little notations and add in all of this additional information. But in Microsoft Outlook, it is extremely easy. There's tons of room for these kinds of notes and you can just make them all over the place. So that is a really useful thing. One note that I did want to make, just so that I, <laughs> I guess this is a bit of CYA for myself, is to say that Outlook is not a dedicated task manager software itself. So what I mean by that is that you need to re be really diligent about managing your tasks because Outlook is not going to move tasks that you don't do. It's not going to prompt you, you know, looking at this uh, start taking medication example again. If for some reason you don't uh, move that task, like if you if you put it on the wrong date and you need to put it somewhere else, 
Outlook doesn't know that, right? So it's not going to do that for you, as opposed to some some scheduling software actually will kind of prompt you a little bit more because the whole point of the prop of the software is to be really um, on top of making sure that you're 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 doing your tasks and that you're you're keeping on top of everything. All right, now I'm going to show you something completely different. I'm going to leave the subject of scheduling and calendars and everything. So this is uh, this is a really great feature. I, I think you're going to like this. So in Outlook. Uh, there is a feature called delay delivery. It is a very useful feature and I'll be showing you all of the different reasons why. First, I wanna show you how to do it. So you open up a new email message like this. You click where it says options. Then you click over here where it says delay delivery. That's gonna bring up this screen where you can click that box which says do not deliver before. And then you can set the date and the time, uh, a future date and time. Obviously you can't can't send a, an email in the past at a, a past date and time, but you set a future date and time. And essentially what's going to happen is your email is going to sit in your outbox. And when it reaches the date and time, the future date and time that you have set, the email is going to send. So that can be a really useful thing. Um, again, I will discuss more about why. Uh, I just want to give this note, which says, um, when you click send, you have to make sure that your computer is on at that future date and time, and you have to make sure that Outlook is running or it may not send, right? It's it's not going to take the email and put it on a server somewhere. Um, it's I, I don't believe anyway. I think that essentially it stays on your local drive, it stays on your local machine, and it does not send uh, at that time. Actually, now that I think about it, there's there are kind of some solutions like this for, for Gmail and for other software or for other email providers, I should say. Um, that presumably you don't need to leave your computer on because Google runs on the internet and the internet is always on. But if you're using Outlook on your local machine, your, your computer or your laptop, you may need to ensure that it is on and that it's running at the, the proper time. So, so why do we do this? So number one, and there's lots of reasons. Uh, so, so this is reason number one. So reason number one is to look diligent. So if you are applying for a, a position with a law firm and you had to choose between sending uh, your email to them at eight in the morning, noon, you know, four in the afternoon uh, and eight in the afternoon, say, you know, which one of those would be the best? I would probably say that 8 a.m. is the one that looks the best. Uh, you may be likely to catch uh, the people, uh, the person that you want to read your email. You're probably going to kind of catch them at the, their freshest at eight in the morning. Uh, it's going to make you look like you are a diligent person. And, and if you don't actually have to, <laughs> to be awake and up in the morning, you know, let's say you've got something else you need to be doing, uh, like sleeping or something, then you can just set your email to send at that time. Um, reason number two is a little bit more practice based, a little bit more practice focused. Um, so it, this is a, a bit of a complex example, so I need to kind of break it down for you. So let's say it is um, uh, Sunday uh, and, then, and then all of a sudden Monday rolls around and then you get these five client emails. You know, first thing Monday morning, you know, client number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. So what you could do is you can take your email uh, to client number one, write your response. Let's say it takes you 10 minutes to draft that response um, and then you can send it. Uh, this is what you could do if you were not using delayed email. You could just send it as per normal without a delay. Then you could move on to the next email. You could take five minutes to draft a response to email number two and then you could send it. Then you move on to email number three and you're drafting that response. However, while you're drafting that response, you get an email back from somebody, you know, either client one or client number two. And then that's actually going to uh, disrupt you and and cause you to be, you know, distracted from continuing to get all your email done and send it out. So what I prefer to do in a situation like this, and, and I've, I've done this for years and years, is in the morning, I take a look at my emails. And generally speaking, if, if none of them are pressing, and, and usually they're not, I will draft my responses to each of these people but I will set the email to send out at like four in the afternoon, like right before the end of the day. So that way I'm controlling the pace of communications. So what's useful about that is there's, a, there's quite a few things. So the most useful thing is that it prevents me from kind of getting an email back and getting distracted. Number two, it helps me kind of stretch out my files, stretch out my work and not, you know, 
get into a, a predicament where, you know, I email the client, they email me back. I email the client, they, they email me back. If their matter is not something that kind of requires that level of attention, and if it's not pressing, you know, let's say, let's say we're just waiting for a court appearance or something, and there's plenty of time, you know, the, the court appearance is two months away. Well, emails from the client, you know, may not be pressing. And in that case, I, I, I want to be able to, you know, have an interaction with them, have a touch on that file, but then I want to be able to work on other things, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is a, a, a slide that I made of a client that I imagined. I actually had a client who every time I would send him an email and no matter what email I sent him, he would respond almost instantaneously. I, this, this picture doesn't show what was in my mind. I actually imagined him at home um, in a house coat on a couch, you know, eating a bowl of cereal with his cell phone in his hand, just, you know, waiting for me to send him an email and then he would email back. But his, his file was actually about an employment issue that was going along just fine. There was no need uh, for him to email me back. It was actually kind of distracting and counterproductive. So by using delayed emails, well, he's, he's actually one of the people that inspired me to start using delayed emails because um, I just didn't think it was helpful. So, so to break it down a little bit more, so, so in this calendar, you know, what if emails are not time critical? What if they can wait, right? So that arrow is pointing at the end of the day, you know, four o'clock. So you can send the email to go out the next day, or you can even send it to go the, the day after that, right? So yeah, as I mentioned, generally speaking, what I would do is I would send all of my non-critical email at the end of the day. Uh, so benefit number one, it, it reduces distractions. Benefit number two, it slows the pace of communications. It makes sure that those people aren't gonna just email me back, right? Um, another, another great benefit. So setting uh, the time to respond to the email, you kind of have the rest of the day to do all of these other things, right? As, as I mentioned, you have this time to get work done on other files. You're not just sitting there, you know, dealing with your email all day, which is not necessarily a productive thing to do. Um, oh, benefit number four. This is a huge benefit, huge benefit. So if I send an email, if I respond to client number one and I say something like, you know, my opinion is threefold, one, two, three. Uh, please see the attached document, you know, have a good day. Um, if I'm sitting there eating lunch at noon and I realize that there's a fourth item that I forgot to mention, like, oh, you know, I, I actually had a fourth opinion that I wanted to include. Uh, and then what if I also forgot to attach the attachment to the email? Well, the great thing is, is that I didn't just send the email right then and there at, you know, eight or nine in the morning. I put it on a delay to send at four o'clock. So because I've got all this time, it's only noon, I'm just finishing my soup and my sandwich. I could go into that email. I can add the document that I forgot to attach before. Great. And I can add that, you know, number four piece. Great. So it really kind of gives you that sober second thought. It, it gives you that time that you can use to think, is there anything that I need to add to this email that I forgot to add? And, you know, if you want as well, what you can do is you can change any email to send immediately. So I just want to note that, you know, you can wax on, you can wax off. If you set the email to send, you know, at the end of the day, but then you decide, you know what, I'd rather just send it now. You could just go into that delayed email, unclick the box, and then it'll send immediately. Uh, benefit number five, huge thing. You know, definitely not something you're thinking about at law school, but it's something to think about in the future. Setting your communications kind of in a more methodical, kind of slower pace, it, it trains clients on what they can expect from you, you know, when they can expect a response from you, you know, how much time you're taking on their file. But it's a good thing, right? So by, by parceling out your email and putting it on a schedule, I find that it really gives you an ability to, to get control over your email, which can be very difficult in legal practice because they start coming pretty fast and furious, the emails. And it also trains clients and even colleagues or, you know, coworkers, staff. It trains people on, on what they can expect from you. Okay, finally, rules. So this is a really important aspect of Outlook. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you how you how to use them and why you should be using them. So generally speaking with my inbox, and I've been trying to do this for a long time, um, I've essentially been aiming to accomplish what's called inbox zero, which means either an empty or a totally empty uh, inbox. Uh, I actually was doing it before I, I even learned that that's what it was called, but it just seemed, it just seemed uh, logical to me to have all kinds of different subfolders so that if, uh, if an email is not really important, you can just put it in a, an archive folder. Or if an email is from a specific person and you get a lot from them, they get their own folder, right? Some kind of a, an organizational scheme. 
So as I mentioned before, with this concept of me not deleting anything, you know, even kind of, you know, quote unquote junk mail or spam or whatever, I don't even really delete that either, generally. Um, I instead make a rule where I have it um, get forwarded somewhere. So uh, for example, something that I recently did, and on occasion I have to do this just to, just to keep on top of things, I made a bunch uh, of new rules to deal with new kind of spam email that I was getting from different sources, but this was stuff that I had signed up for, you know, newsletters and things like that. But uh, I don't want that stuff to go into my inbox. It's not really of the same quality as, as emails from, you know, real human beings that I know in my life. So um, I would set up different folders. So the way that you uh, the way that you set up the folders and the way that you create these rules is as follows. So you're going to right click on the uh, the email or sorry you're you're on the email. You're going to right click on the email and then you're going to get that drop down menu. And then you click on rules and then you click on create rules. You're going to get this window which comes up which allows you to set the parameters. So at the top there you'll see that I clicked from LinkedIn and then um, at the bottom it says move the item to a folder. And between those two checkboxes, you can see there's all kinds of other stuff you can have happen. You can um, you can just set it so that the message has to contain something specific or who it's sent to. You can have it play a sound if, if you receive it. Um, you can have it display an alert. But generally, what I do is I just set up, you know, from this source, move it to here. And then the here is this folder, this LinkedIn folder that I made. And that's something that I had already made before. If you don't know how to set up a folder, you just right click on your inbox and you go to new and then you can make a new folder. So I made a folder called LinkedIn, uh, click OK. And then it says this rule, LinkedIn has been created. And then checkbox is next to run this rule now uh, on messages that are already in the folder. So that way it'll clean up all the ones that are there. And then you click on OK and then voila. So all of those emails will go immediately from the uh, inbox into this folder called LinkedIn, which makes it a lot easier in the future when I go into my email and I see that I've got um, different folders with different emails in them. I can just click on the folders and go through them. Okay, so then why use the rules in the first place? So generally speaking, it's to help your future self by staying organized, and it works a lot faster than dragging and dropping emails. For example, with, with the LinkedIn email that I received, if every time I received a LinkedIn email, if I was gonna drag it and drop it into a folder, that's gonna take me that time every time to click the mouse, drag it over there. Uh, and you know sometimes you might miss and you put it into the wrong folder and then you have to go into that folder and move it. So this is just a lot faster to have a rule automatically move the email every time I get one. It's also much easier to find and review your new emails. So in uh, a view like this, you know, my inbox is 28 emails. I've, I kind of let it build up so that I would have a demo to show you. But basically, you know, I'll, I can go into my inbox and I can click through all those emails and I'll know that those are real emails generally. And then I can also go to the, that next folder down. It's, it's blurred out. I can go to that one below that says one. I can go down to the next one. And as soon as you click on one of those folders, it's going to automatically highlight the first email that's in there. So because it's highlighting the first email, you'll essentially be kind of viewing it and then that'll be that, it'll be gone. It'll be reviewed and then it won't be showing it as a new email anymore. So I find that to be a really helpful way to deal with my email. Uh, I can get through my email work way faster by setting up those rules. It just takes a little bit of time to set up, but then once you've got that in place, you know, you reap the benefits long-term. Okay, and with that, we are at the final slide. If you wanted to visit my YouTube channel, I have a video about that, which explains everything that's great about Picture Manager and how to set it up. And additionally, there's also some videos that cover uh, some of the subjects that I just discussed about Outlook. How to use rules in Outlook, how to organize tasks in Outlook, how to schedule email delivery in Outlook, and actually a bonus subject that I didn't discuss, which is how to use quick parts in Outlook. So if you'd like to check that out on my YouTube channel, you can do that at your convenience. Okay, and with that, we have reached the conclusion of uh, part two and of this, this session, Microsoft Office for Law School and Beyond. And if you learned something new from this video, please let me know by leaving a comment below right now. Uh, if I taught you something new about Excel or about PowerPoint, let me know. Um, are you going to start using OneNote or did I teach you anything about Outlook that you're going to put into use? Please let me know. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel so that you'll receive regular updates about future content. 
And finally, if you haven't checked it out already, please take a look at my Law Student Tech course, which is about a one and a half hour series on the best ways to use different types of computer hardware and software at law school, and also in legal practice once you get out into the field. As with this video series, I've actually received a lot of great feedback from people who have taken it. And I think that no matter your computer skill level or where you are in your legal journey, the Law Student Tech course will teach you a lot of great new ways to be a better law student through better technology. And yeah, thank you again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. I'm Sean Dillman.